I'm grateful that the battle belongs to you, for we cannot overcome our enemy. He is wiser and smarter and just better able to defeat than we are to find victory. But by your hand, by your power, by your grace, your mercy, you overcome the evil one in our lives and you lead us to a victory. Such as that victory that took place on the cross of Calvary. Probably thought he had won. He killed you. Had you placed in a grave, but you walked out three days later. And now we celebrate. We lift up your name on high for you are worthy of all praise, all glory, and all honor. Father, we celebrate the victory. In the moment we're going to be doing that Lord's Supper as a reminder of that victory because you have won. Thank you for that victory in our lives of salvation and may we continue to glorify you in all that we say and do. Now Lord, as we approach your word, may you speak to us from it. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So over the last several Sundays, with the tip of the last week, um, Aaron was here. We've been looking at prayer as a way of understanding what it is we say we believe. You know, we want to practice our purpose of exalting Christ, of equipping the Christian, of engaging the community, and of evangelizing the Christless. Um, prayer has to be a part of our life. Prayer must be a part of what we're doing. And, and if you're like many people, there are times when you pray and it feels like those prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. You, you feel like God's not hearing you, uh, that they're not having any traction, and, and you, it's not that you're being told no, it just feels like it's not. It's just not connecting with God. And, and that is a reality. This, this happens, and when people come to me and go, man, pastor, this is what it feels like, I'm, Usually one of the first things we, we talk about is, is there sin in someone's life. Uh, sin will separate us. It will bring that wall between us. It will have un, that unconfessed sin makes it where it's harder to pray. And generally God is convicting us of sin so we might confess it. So the thing is, sin, it's not like we generally jump in with two feet. You, know, you, go, you, you go to that swimming pool and you kind of touch it to see if it's cold or uh, then you just jump in after a while. Um, sin is not like that. Sin just slowly diverts us from the from the path that we're supposed to be on. It was like when I was first moved to Fort Worth, the seminary. I was going to go to a mall. As we were headed for that, as I was headed to that mall, the road was blocked. And you think, oh, it's simple. You just kind of get off and get right back on, you know. But no, they had us go through a neighborhood, and somewhere I missed the sign that said "Turn here." And I spent the next twenty minutes trying to figure out where I was. And that was before GPS and cell phones and all that stuff. I just kind of drove around until I, I hit a highway and then got on it. But, you know, that you get lost. And, and sin does that. Sin is, is us missing the mark to the point that we are now diverted from what God wants us to be. And if you're just 1% off the mark, you, you eventually end up way, way off where you want to be. You go to in a place in a direction you don't mean to be. It looked like you were fine until you got to where you, you thought, wow, I'm, I'm in deeper and further than I meant to be. And all sin does that. So if we want to be people of prayer, we want to have the joy and the commitment of our prayer life, and we want to experience the answers to our prayers, whether it's no or yes, then we need to make sure that our lives are not having these spiritual roadblocks of sin. And as all sin is important to God and it separates us from God, and we, we need to examine ourselves, the scripture tells us, on a regular basis so that we are purifying ourselves before Him. So this morning we're going to turn to Psalm 66, verse 18. And as we turn there, if you'll stand with us, uh, we'll be reading two verses, but the only one I'm going to have you turn to is Psalm 66, 18. And, and then you can stand with us. <clears throat> Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Then Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor 
are his ear so dull that it, they cannot hear? But your iniquities have made separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. We ask that you to speak to us today from it. Encourage us to confess whatever it is that we might have been holding back from you so that we might get right, so that our prayers will be heard, and that the influence of your hand upon our lives will be felt. We ask that in the name of Christ. Amen. You can sit down. So, both of these texts indicate that unconfessed sin comes between God and the person who has not confessed it. That it causes separation, that it causes a, a, a break in the fellowship. Not that God has abandoned us, not that God has thrown us away, not that God is going to leave us behind. It's just that God says, look, I'm working on something else in your life instead of just what you're wanting me to work on. And I need you to get clean so that I may work more effectively. It's not that we hinder God, okay? God is bigger than our sin. But God chooses to let us dwell in our sin as, if you want to say punishment's not the right word, but I can't think of a better one, in order that we might move forward out of that sin and that we might confess it, get it out so that we can do what He wants. And some of these sins are listed in your bulletin there. Uh, there's so many more. Um, uh, the ultimate root of sin, of course, is pride, and we're not even going to touch on that one. Uh, pride is, is saying, I know better than God, and every sin is me saying, I know better than God. Every time I leave, uh, uh, sin unconfessed is me saying, I know better than God. And so ultimately, pride is at the root of all of these, and we're going to look at these as it is. Um, anger, uh, maybe you're angry. I know Christians aren't supposed to be angry, but the reality is we all get angry. Things happen. People hurt us. Things are said to us. Um, the, the car has a flat. Whatever. You know, we get mad about certain stuff. And we get angry. Sometimes we get angry towards God. But most of the time it is angry towards our fellow man. And anger towards our fellow man is something that separates us from God. Because you see, God loves man. God loves every man. God loves that most despicable, horrible, thieving, sinning individual you can imagine just as much as he loves the best person in the world. His love is equal for all. And when we have anger in our heart towards one who God created, it is us having anger towards that whom God says, I have loved. And because God loves them and God gave Jesus Christ for them and that he may sacrifice his life on the cross of Calvary so that they could have eternal life. When we harbor anger in our hearts towards one whom God loves, we no longer become eternally concerned about that person. We might think we are, but our anger will overshadow our eternal concern for the one to whom we're angry with. Now, there is righteous anger, biblically. Okay, so let's not let's understand. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the anger that leads to sin. The, the anger that separates us. Um, in 1 Timothy 2.8, we find that Paul writes, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger and disputing. Now, isn't it interesting that Tim, uh, Paul felt the need to stick in there this idea that you're going to pray without anger or disputing concerning your fellow man. Now, if we're angry with somebody and we, we want to be righteous with it, we can come to the Lord and say, God, I'm angry about this person. I need it cleared up because I'm not as concerned about their eternal needs right now as I am concerned about my desire to, to punch them, to get even, take your pick, bury, it, bury them. Okay. Um, remind me never to make Robin mad. <laughs> I'm sure that comes from her family, though. No. <laughs> you know, seriously, we all we, we all get there, don't we? I wanted to bury people. Our feet into the alligators. Take your pick. You know, just disappear from the face of the earth because they made me so mad. They hurt me so deep. And when we hang on to this kind of stuff, it hurts our relationship with God. 
It hurts our relationship with the one who loves the one to whom we're angry with. John 4, 2 says, be slow to anger, but abounding in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love is not easily wrong. And when we think about these texts, what we see is the antithesis of anger is love. The, the opposite of love, we often call hate. But where does hate usually get to birth? In anger. We don't normally hate someone who we haven't been mad at. Or we're upset with. And so when we want to shine the light of Christ, when we want to, to let the truth of Jesus shine through and impact the life of somebody, we have to set aside anger for love. And that means that we pray for the person who we're mad at. Not only do we pray for our forgiveness and our ability to let it go and God to work in us, but we pray for them so that God may touch their eternal, their eternal life, their eternal souls, and change them. Um, Anthony Block, blank, B-L-A-N-C, uh, was a convert of Felix Neff in the early 1800s in Germany. And he would go and he would go to these villages and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he made many enemies because of the, the, the influence of the Catholic Church as well as other um, cults that were around at the time. And in one of these places, as he was returning home from a meeting, he was followed by a man who was in a rage and struck, struck him heavily upon the head and cursed him. And Anthony said to him, well, may God forgive and bless you. And the man responded, if God does not kill you, I will do so myself. And then went off in a rage. Three days later, in that same town, he's um, Anthony goes down this built this uh, alley that's really narrow. And in, as he's halfway through, that gentleman turns in the other end, and, and he thinks to himself, "Well, this man will strike me or curse me again." And he pre he prepared himself for it. And instead, as the man got close, he he said, "Mr. Blunt, will you forgive me and let it all be over?" And consequently, this gentleman who had cursed him and had struck him had come to Christ. Because he didn't get angry, he responded in a, a good manner, a, a right manner. The eternal heart of the, of the gentleman who was angry got changed instead. Now, second thing you see there is idolatry. You look at there and you say, oh, idolatry is on that list, but we don't live in a day and age where we have... Um, all these little things in our homes. We don't put little idols in our home and we worship those things like the Hindu might or the, the other pagan religions out there where they, they, they put Buddha or something else in their homes. We, we don't do that in America. Uh, not, in, not in most cases. And, and that's true. We have gotten past that place where we build idols of wood and stone and, and, and metal. Instead, we build those idols in our hearts and we build altars in our hearts. Because anything that comes before God is an idol. Anything. Now, Ezekiel 14.3, um, Ezekiel said this to the elders of Israel, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of them by all? At, at all. And then Exodus 20, verse 4 says, You should not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth below or in the water below. And we think, oh, just because I don't have some physical idol in my home, we satisfy this. But the reality is, many of us often build idols in our home, in our heart, without even meaning to. You know, we, we look at um, the different things in life, and, and we say, oh, this is important, and that's important, and that's important. And the next thing we know, we've let Bible study slide. We've let prayer slide. We've let coming to church slide, because we want to do all these other important things. And what those important things have become are idols. You know, when I was, um, I think in my second, maybe my third church, and I, well, what, uh, the football season came along, and I literally had a man come up and say, I'm leaving at noon because the Cowboys are playing. And my, I swear, my response to him was, don't come to church at all if you can't put Jesus first. And he got angry with me. He's like, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. You've already pronounced it upon yourself. You see, when we put sports, family, job, money, anything else, take your pick. Anything else before God 
It is an idol. We don't come here on Sunday. We don't read our Bible daily. We don't do these things in order just to appease a God. And so he'll go, oh, I'm going to bless you. He is the all of life. He is the everything. And if our lives are not being lived with him as the number one aspect of who we are, then there are idols in our lives. My family is not before God. My children, my car, money, take your pick. These things are not before God. They must come after him because he is the supplier of all. And if I worship anything that he has created, then I have abandoned him for the creator. And it will not save. The ancient Israelites literally put idols in their homes and they were destroyed for it. And now today, we lift up the idolatry of, of race. We lift up the idolatry of transgenderism, homosexual. We, we, we sin. And our, and our nation has made a, a, a god of all of these things. And, it's, and literally, it seems like they worship these things. And we will face destruction as a result. Because we have, been, had, we have made idols in our lives. And when you and I as Christians put idols in our life, it, it builds a barrier between you, me, and God so that he will not hear us or at least he's not going to do what we want until we purge ourselves of these idols. Whether it's sports, whatever it is, we must toss it aside and let God be God in our lives. You see there, your third thing is indifference to needs. Um, you look at our world and we got a world, oh, we got to take care of this and we got to take care of these people and do this, do that. And yet we find consistently that that's not what goes on. When we talk about taking care of different people for different reasons and, and yet those same poor people are still out there, aren't they? Now, that's not what we're talking about with indifference of needs. Indifference of needs is when I just don't care what's going on in someone else's life. I, I see or I hear what's going on, and I think, well, you know, that doesn't impact my life, so I'm just going to move on. And we don't pray for people. We don't lift them up. Uh, Proverbs 21, 13 says, If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. So we, we think about what God is doing in this world, and we look at what's going on in the Ukraine and all these refugees that are fleeing, and we think, I can't do anything. Sure you can. You pray. You can be concerned about what God is doing. It's not impacting your life per se, but it is impacting the life of people created in the very image of Jesus Christ. People whom God says He has loved. And while God has allowed these events to take place so that other things may, may happen, we must still be concerned about the one who has need. And in our own community, we have people who have need that sometimes we hear about, many times we don't, um, just because it's not shared. But when we hear about it, we can pray for those folks. People whose houses burn down or who, who lose a job or, you know, in today's economy just can't make ends meet. You know, we, we may not be able to help them financially, but we can help them by, by praying for them. And if we can help them financially or at least feed them, we, do, we, we fulfill Matthew 25, 36, where he talked about clothing the, the naked and feeding the hungry and, and giving water to the thirsty and visiting the prisoner in prison. That's the fulfillment of that. But when we have an indifference of needs, when we don't care about our fellow man and their, their physical needs, are we really going to care about our fellow man and their spiritual needs? Are we really going to meet the spiritual needs of someone who we don't care about their physical needs? And I can tell you the answer is no. Because what the, the person will do is that you don't care about me physically. I know you don't care about me spiritually. At least that's what they'll think. And, and they would be right. Um, many years ago, a Methodist minister uh, by the name of Dr. Latch in the east end of London uh, ministered in that area. And he got wind of a, a gentleman who was sick and was going to die. And he went by to visit with this gravely ill individual. And when he... Um, knocked on the door and was invited in. As soon as he walked in, the man recognized him from his clerical collar, turned his face to the wall, and refused to speak to him. Uh, Mr. Lack, Dr. Lax 
noted the dreariness of the room and the pitiful small fire and suspected that the uh, financial circumstance of this individual was lacking where he probably hadn't had any food in a while. So he, he prayed over the man left and went to the butcher shop just down the street and sent two lamb chops to the house. A couple of days later, he goes back to the house and this time the, the man doesn't turn his face away from him. He's still not very talkative, but he's at least a little more friendly and lets Dr. Lax have a conversation with him and pray over him. And again, as he's on his way out, he sends two more lamb chops to the, to the house. After that, he had to leave town for a few days, and when he got back, he was informed that the old man had died. And his heart was immediately grieved. But the person who was informing him said this to him, said, but Dr. Lax, we were told from, from that gentleman to tell you this. He says, I'm going to God. Not because you visited me, not because you prayed for me, but because you sent me lamb chops. And those lamb chops told me that God cared too. You see, we have a responsibility to help those less fortunate. Now, it's not we don't give everything away, but we do minister to those around us in order that they might see the love of Jesus Christ. That they may know that we care and that he cares. We're the example. Fourth one you see there is hypocrisy. Now I know none of you have ever said one thing and done something else. That, that you, you guys aren't like me where you said what you're going to do next and instead you did Y. Uh, but hy hypocrisy um, is alive and well within the church. And the world knows, in fact, the, the number one reason people reject Jesus Christ is because people in the church don't live what they say they believe. That's the number one reason. That, that, that they, you talk to folks and they, why have you, well, because so-and-so did X and didn't live what he said he believed. All the examples I see are, are bad. And that's just the reality. Um, Henry Drummond, a great Scottish professor, talked about how the Infidel Club was started in Glasgow. Um, in Glasgow, England, um, big churches there, lots of people. And, and one day, one of these men who was a banker walked by, and, and the group that was standing there, another man um, who was standing next to Henry Drummond said, that right there is the founder of the Infidel Club. And, and Henry looked at him and said, but that man goes to my church. He's a pillar of the community. And the other gentleman said, yes, sir, we know that. But his behavior within the community outside of the church is so horrible that he has turned many young men away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of those men founded a club called the Infidel Club. How would that be on your epitaph? Put that on your gravestone. Helped people turn away from Christ. You see, our hypocrisy is something that will hurt our relationship with God, hinder our prayers, and, and keep us from being able to minister to people. A few churches back, uh, after I got to that church, I began visiting throughout the community, knocking on doors. And, and as I knocked on doors, a pattern emerged as they kept asking if one of the deacons was still there. Is so and so still there? Yeah. Not going to come to church. He's a horrible individual. And I found out some sins from these different people that this guy was doing in the community while he was over here holding up himself as a, a pillar. And he was engaged in activities that he should not be engaged in, doing things that he should not have been doing. And as a result, many in the community was, were rejecting Christ as a result. So it's not to throw him under the bus. It's just to say that our hypocrisy cannot be hidden. It will be made known. And the world will take note and say, well, he says he's a Christian. She says she's a Christian, but her behavior is anything but. Matthew 6, 5 says this. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by men. And I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. And you know the rest of that says when you pray, go into your closet. Pray privately. Where your right hand and your left hand don't even know what's going on. And, and glorify the Lord. 
and, and confess, <clears throat> be humble before the Lord so that he may be glorified. For this world is about him, <clears throat> not us. Now we all slip up. And when we slip up, just go and confess it and move on. And the last thing we see is unforgiveness or broken relationships. Um, when we hold unforgiveness in our hearts, that is one of those things that God has said in his word that he is going to hold against us, even as Christians. Now, it won't keep us out of heaven. It won't get, make us lose our salvation. But what it does do is make our relationship with God very difficult to continue. And he will consistently bring upon us a, a, a desire to confess. He will bring upon us the spiritual discipline so that we might get right with him. He will come upon us in order that we might give that forgiveness to the earthly person in order that we might have forgiveness from him. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. We, 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 we read these verses, but then we don't want to believe them. But God means it. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone... Forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. You see, the implication of that is if we refuse to forgive, that God's going to hold it against us. And that he's going to say, you know what? I'm not going to forgive your sin right now. I'm not, it's already covered by the blood. It's already dealt with. But I'm not going to allow you to experience the forgiveness of sin. And that's a rough spot. You know, if, you've, if you've been in sin and you've understood it, you've under, been under conviction, you, you know how hard that is. And he says you need to forgive others. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, this is straight up speaking to Christians. This is not to the lost person. The lost person comes and says, I need Jesus. And Jesus says, okay. The Christian comes and says, hey, I need forgiveness. He said, but you've got something against somebody. You're holding anger. You're holding all your stuff against this person. And because you're unforgiving, and because you've broken that relationship, you've broken our relationship. So you need to fix that as much as you possibly can. At the, at the minimum, forgive them. That relationship might not be able to be restored. God understands that. But he says, don't hold it against them. Don't, don't come to me thinking, I'm going to forgive you when you refuse to give forgiveness to others. So it's not the way it works. Let me ask you this. How many of you have come, came to Christ because somebody in your family or a friend? Anybody? Somebody in your family? A friend? Yeah. Same here, you know I mean? My, my family. So because a family member or a friend, you know, they, they, they came to Christ. In fact, if you go and you ask throughout the, the world, 86 out of 100 people came to Christ because a family member, a friend, or a co-worker, somebody personally invited them to church. 86 out of 100. And if you have unforgiveness towards that person, what are the odds you're going to invite them to church? What are the odds you're going to minister to them in the name of Jesus Christ? They're pretty slim. But if you can reconcile a relationship, if you can have forgiveness and practice forgiveness towards somebody, they will be more open and more apt to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they may be willing to come to church. Because people influence people. Those televangelists or even the pre TV preachers, the guy on the radio, all of these different ministries that are out there, while some do make impact, at least 14 people out of 100, the greater impact is when you and I individually minister to somebody else in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we have any of these sins in our lives, it, it brings about complications. So according to the text that we read earlier in Psalms and, and in Isaiah, sin separates man from God, even after salvation. And, and uh, unlike the Israelites who would practice their uh, uh, attempts to appease God with sacrifices, today we attempt to practice our appeasement by coming to church and offering um, offering, uh, our, our offering our own tithes to the Lord. 
our time. Okay, I've spent two hours at church, God. You should be happy for the week. And it's not the way it works. As it is in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, both God wants our life. God wants all of us that we might live our lives in accordance to his word. And part of that is a continually um, searching of our lives and confessing our sins so that we might have a relationship with him that is open and honest where he will speak to us and glorify his name. It is what he wants to do. Sin is like when we have a, 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 clean, a, a crink in the wire that will not let the light come on and we have to go and fix the wire so the light will come back on. It, it breaks the electricity. It breaks the flow. And we need to get right before the Lord. Um, we, have a, we have a generation out there. We have a people out there who need Jesus. And if you'll just someday just go out and park in Lowe's parking lot and watch the people going in and out, they're all broken. They all need Jesus. 7-Eleven parking lot, take your pick. Go up to the school just watch the moms and the dads dropping off the kids. And you'll see brokenness in the cars as they're yelling at their children. As they're being ugly to one another as a husband and wife. And this community needs this church to look like Jesus. And this, as we go out and be seen. We don't need the community to say, well, that church doesn't care. The people in that church don't care. They that they're not a part of us. They don't have no idea what we're going through. They're going to say that anyway to some degree, but it doesn't have to be true. We can pray for them and minister to them in the very name of Jesus Christ. But to do so, we had best be confessing our sins and getting right with the Lord so that he might use us for his glory. Let's pray.